Well, that's Mayor Mouse. Yeah. 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 She's one of our graduating residents, and uh, all graduating residents are required to do the grand rounds to pick a topic of their choice. And she's going to talk about pediatric health and nutrition. So she may be a timely and good topic from here. Thank you, Dr. Bocchini. Uh, good morning, everyone. Today I'll be speaking to you all about uh, pediatric health and nutrition. And the reason why I chose this topic is because I felt like in the past three years of my training, whether I was on the floor, in clinic, or in the ER, I had a lot of issues that dealt with um, the basics of health and nutrition. So I just think it's a big topic that a general pediatrician should be knowledgeable about. So I do not have anything to disclose. So my objectives today are to understand and apply uh, current practice guidelines at, of pediatric nutrition from infancy to young adult. Describe the essential vitamin deficiencies <coughs> in the field of pediatrics and identify and explain preventative care in areas of childhood obesity. So we'll begin with the first year of life. Feeding development is a learned progression of behaviors. And feeding practices um, during the first two years of life really help to establish lifelong eating habits. So it's really important to develop these healthy eating habits early. And there's three main goals in the first year of life, which are acquisition of nutrients for optimal growth, to balance energy and take to energy needs, and acquisition of oral motor skills and appropriate eating behaviors. Infant nutritional requirements uh, really depend on the age, um, as you can see in the table, and as the infant is getting older, nutritional requirements do decrease. And actual energy requirements for an infant vary um, depending on individual characteristics um, that include medical needs and catch-up growth, such as preterm infants. And energy requirements for breastfed infants are actually up to 15% less than formula fed infants. So eating intake is influence, influenced by four main things. Number of eating occasions, number of foods consumed, energy density of foods consumed, and portion sizes. So always remember that infants have this innate ability to really self-regulate between these four things. So human milk versus infant formula. We see this a lot, almost every day in clinic. And the AAP recommends that exclusive breastfeeding um, should be done until six months of age, which is supported by multiple control trials and observational studies. Um, and all these studies show that infants that were breastfed um, had <laughs> way fewer GI infections and also decreases their risk for atopic dermatitis. So uh, breast milk does meet nutritional requirements for the first six months of life. And after six months of life um, is when you can start supplementing with uh, complementary foods. So it's always important to promote breastfeeding in your general practice unless the mother does have a contraindication such as uh, HIV. So what are the objectives for complementary foods? Um, it's to support growth, satisfy hunger, and supplement energy and nutrient needs. And what are complementary foods? There are solid foods and liquid foods other than human milk or formula. Um, that are consumed by the infants as they make that transition from a liquid diet to a more modified adult diet. And so after six months, when breast milk does become inefficient to kind of support the infant's requirements for energy, protein, zinc, and iron, and some fat-soluble vitamins, it's very important to add these complementary foods. So developmental skills uh, always plays a role in how we are going to advance the diet for the infant. Parents will always come to you and ask, when can I start solids on my child? And so number one thing you always want to think about is good head control. So solid foods should be delayed until the infant is able to sit with support and has good head and neck control. Other things that may play a role are adequate truncal control, which is the ability to push up from the prone position with straight elbows, ability to propel pre pureed foods to the posterior pharynx for swallowing, and extinction of the extrusion reflex, which involves uh, raising the tongue and pushing against any object that's placed in the mouth, and ability to indicate a desire for food. So uh, I've had a couple of moms in the past couple of years that'll come and tell me that, oh, I just gave my two or three month olds some mashed potatoes the other day. No big deal. But <laughs> you really need to sit down with the mom and stress the importance that you really want your infant to wait because they could aspirate, um, it could cause inadequate or excess intake of energy or nutrients and increased renal solute load 
And obviously, there's always that increased risk for obesity. On the other end of it, you also have moms that are too nervous to start solid foods. So with them, you can discuss that it is time to start solid foods because it can cause decreased growth. Um, it can cause iron deficiency. It can delay their oral motor function. And they can cause, have an aversion to solid foods. <laughs> So overfeeding, um, this is something that we see a lot in the clinic in the ER. Mom will come in and bring their baby saying, oh, my baby's vomiting after every feed. And after you get a good diet history, you realize the mom's definitely overfeeding. So it's good to talk to the mom and tell them that this is causing the baby discomfort. The baby may be swallowing air, so it produces more gas. And the baby's going to be spitting up more and cause loose stools. And obviously, the baby's going to be crying more. And sometimes what I do is I bring up the growth chart in the, in the room and show them that your baby's gaining weight and that you want your infant to be a good feeder and you want the baby to gain weight, you just don't want them to gain weight too fast. Because then what happens is they can become heavier and that's going to delay them in reaching their milestones such as uh, crawling or pulling themselves up to stand. And then sometimes, and then usually by that point they understand that they need to back up on the feedings. So some cues to tell mom about if a baby is hungry, <laughs> A baby who's hungry will latch onto breast or bottle and suck continuously. A baby who is getting full during a feeding will take longer pauses between sucking. And a baby who is full will turn away from the breast or bottle and not want to suck anymore. So as solid foods are introduced, um, an infant should consume no more than 28 to 32 ounces of formula or breast milk in a day. And single ingredient foods should be introduced first. Infant cereals and pureed meats are a good source to provide iron and zinc. And iron and zinc are the most common nutrients that infants are going to be deficient in. And at least one feeding per day should contain foods rich in vitamin C to promote that iron absorption. And you can get that through like apple or orange juice. So cereals are good choices for first foods because they supply that additional energy and iron. And parents can choose from single grain infant cereals um, that gives that additional energy and iron. Um, I feel like our parents mainly do rice cereal, just because it's very easily accessible and it's the least allergenic. Wheat cereal is another choice. And it's also very important that you tell the parents not to put the cereal in the bottle, and that's mainly used for reflux. But at this age, they really need to be eating cereal from a bowl and a spoon so that that can enhance their oral motor function and they can start developing some speech. So pureed foods, um, these provide a diverse and balanced meals for the infant. And single ingredient purees should be started first. And um, they can puree the food and thin it with breast milk, uh, water, or formula to get the desired consistency that they want. And you can also advise mom to do home pureed foods. Um, advantages of this is that they provide freshness. Um, there's an increased variety in texture. It's cheaper, and you can avoid all the, those preservatives. And um, once the thin puries are tolerated and the infant can sit independently and tries to grasp food um, on his own, you can start uh, advancing those thicker puries. Also, uh, remember to combine iron-rich foods with those high in vitamin C because um, that helps um, absorb that iron better. So just always remember, meatballs go with tomato sauce. So fruit juices um, need to be introduced by six months of age uh, for vitamin C, and it should be 100% fruit juice, not the fake fruit drink. And this will make up a well-balanced diet for infants. And the AAP Committee of Nutrition makes these following recommendations for fruit juices. It should be offered from a cup. It should not exceed four to six ounces per day. It should be used as a meal or a snack, or with meal or snack, and not sip throughout the day, which is what I see a lot happening. It should not be consumed at bedtime or in bed. And excessive fruit juice can cause diarrhea, abdominal pain, and uh, de dental caries. So what are foods and beverages to av avoid in the first year of life? Hard round foods, um, such as nuts, grapes, raw carrots, and round candies. Um, these can all lead to choking. Honey, obviously, because it's associated with infant <coughs> botulism. Cow's milk, rice, almond and coconut milk, soda, tea, and coffee, anything that's highly allergenic. Um, but there have been some recent trials that show that early introduction of peanut butter can cause a less development to peanut allergy. 
So that's something that we can start telling our moms. Finger foods and self-feeding um, really starts around uh, eight to 10 months and the infants start to really begin to refine their skills. They're able to sit independently, they have good eye-hand coordination and they're starting to develop that chewing and they start to develop that fine print to grasp. By nine to 12 months, infants have a more manual dexterity to feed themselves. They want to drink from a cup using two hands and eat soft table foods. So common nutrient deficiencies we see in the first year of life are iron, fluoride, vitamin D, and zinc. So by four months of age, uh, breastfed infants really exceed the amount of iron needed that one can be provided by human milk. So a full-term infant um, requires one mg per kg per day. And if you're formula fed, um, you don't really usually need any more iron supplementation because there's enough iron in the formula. Uh, premature infants need more, and low birth weight infants, they need about two to four mg per kg per day. And that's because their iron stores are depleted by two to three months of age. So it's also good to test these premature infants in your practice for anemia around two months of age. So fluoride supplementation begins at six months of age, and um, this actually really depends on the water source, and it's mainly warranted for infants that are being fed by ready-to-feed formula, because the water made by that formula is not, does not contain fluoride. And once teeth are present, fluoride varnish is applied every three to six months, and this helps prevent dental caries. Vitamin D. Um, supplementation should be provided to all exclusively fed breastfed infants and then non-breastfed infants who are not getting enough amount of vitamin D through their milk and that's if they're not getting 30 at least 32 ounces of formula a day um, and so who's at risk breastfed infants mothers who are exposed to sunlight or who are not exposed to sunlight and breastfed infants who are not exposed to sunlight so nursing mothers um, already don't have too much vitamin D and so they don't have enough to really pass on to the milk so the AAP recommends vitamin intake um, in the first year of life should be about 400 uh, international units per day. And so vitamin D deficiency can also lead to rickets, uh, which is a disease of the, growing, uh, the growing bone, and it can cause inadequate mineralization of the bone. Um, the babies can present with bone tenderness. Later, they'll have dental problems, muscle weakness, and increased tendency for fractures. So it's always important to promote um, those vitamin D drops in your practice. And lastly, zinc. Um, at six months of age, uh, breast milk decreases in zinc and iron. So it's best to absorb this through the meat, and you can also get it through beans and lentils. Um, zinc deficiency babies are gonna present with restlessness, irritability, and failure to thrive. And an important uh, rash that's associated with, rich, uh, with zinc deficiency is acrodermatitis enteropathica, which is an eczematous rash um, with vesiculobullous lesions, and they rupture and crust over, and it's mainly found in the perianal and oral areas. And you can treat zinc deficiency babies with oral zinc. So this I thought was a good reference guide that we could have in our clinic. Um, it really breaks down all the different nutrients and how much uh, depending on their age, is required for the infants. This was also another reference guide um, that I think we could have a clinic and we should start passing these out at well child visits. Really breaks down for the moms um, what uh, kind of foods their babies should be getting at each age. Now we'll be moving on to the toddler age group. Um, at this age, they're really trying to achieve that independence and start mastering their feeding skills. And it's an important task for them to develop, especially in the early childhood. Toddlers may eat variable quantities at any given meal, and they should be able to choose from a variety of meals. Um, there's an eruption of deciduous teeth. The children learn to feed themselves independently, and they transition into that more modified adult diet. So eating environment, this is very important because this really helps promote good eating habits. It needs to be free from distractions. It needs to be a designated area with an appropriate chair and family meals need to be happening. Um, this provides an opportunity for children to learn healthy eating habits and begin to appreciate the social aspects of eating. And I think this needs to be promoted at all well child visits. 
And so what are the caregiver's responsibilities? Those include uh, they need to provide a variety of nutritious foods to the child. They need to find structure and timing of meals, so have a set schedule. Create mealtime environment that facilitates eating and social exchange. Um, and they need to recognize the child's signals for hunger and fullness. And they also need to model healthy eating habits so that they'll want to copy them. In 2011, there was a meta-analysis of observational studies that was done, and um, children and adolescents who shared meals with their family greater than three times per week were more likely to be of normal weight and have healthy dietary eating habits, um, less likely to engage in disordered eating, and there was a decreased risk of overweight and obesity in young adulthood. Picky eaters. We definitely see this a lot in clinic also. Um, moms will come in frustrated saying my kid's not eating anything and we just need to reassure them. Tell the mom that this is often normal for toddlers to go through this. They go through these phases and for weeks they may be interested in eating one or two things and the next week it'll be something else. And sometimes they want to eat a heavy breakfast, a heavy lunch and not eat anything for dinner. So some advice you can give to the mom is just always have the healthy food choices like veggies and fruits. Stick to a routine, be patient, Set a good example and minimize distractions. So energy is provided through three primary macronutrients. You have your proteins, your fats, and your carbs. And proteins should constitute about 5 to 20% of total energy intake uh, for children 1 to 3 years of age and 10 to 30% of total energy intake for children 4 to 18 years of age. Fat should constitute 30 to 35% of total energy intake for children 2 to 3 years of age and 25 to 35% of total energy intake for children 4 to 18 years of age. And carbs are very important because they help support and transport vitamins, minerals, and trace elements. And so they should constitute for 45 to 65% of total energy intake. So now we'll be moving into dietary guidelines for children and adolescents that are recommended by the AAP. So first, meats and other protein foods. Uh, really, this is uh, not everything that they can choose from, but I think it's just important to uh, stress to the parents that they need to select and prepare any of these items with little as fat as possible. Whole fruit um, is preferred, and so fruits and vegetables, they should have a variety of fruits and vegetables, and that should be offered every day. They need to involve the child in selecting and preparing of these fruits. I think that would get the child more excited, cut them into shapes, and uh, the parent needs to be a role model by eating fruits and veggies. And whole fruit is preferred to fruit juice, but about half of the recommended daily servings can be provided in the form of 100% fruit juice. And consumption of 100% fruit juice is limited to four to six ounces in a child one to six years of age, and eight to 12 ounces in a child that is older than seven years. Another trick to tell the parents to kind of get their kids to eating um, fruits and veggies is just add it to sandwiches, add it to pasta, chili, soups, and even pizza. They can add fruits to cereal and to pancakes, and that they should be providing fruits and veggies for every snack. I just thought this was funny. <laughs> Okay, bread, cereals, and starches. Whole grain bread, cereals, rice, pasta. Uh, I think it's, it's very important to tell the mom that once they pick up any of these items, the first uh, thing, ingredient they should read on the label is whole grain. Um, this is just a healthier choice for the child. So this table really breaks down uh, how many servings of the different kinds of foods that a child from one to 18 should be receiving a day. Um, for fruits and veggies, they need one source of vitamin C and vitamin A. Uh, vitamin C is daily and vitamin A is every other day. So for vitamin C, they can get that through citrus fruits, such as uh, juices, strawberries. Um, and for veggies, they can get it through broccoli and tomatoes. Uh, for vitamin A, they can get that from dark green, uh, yellow fruits like melons. And for veggies, they can get it through spinach, sweet potatoes, corn, and squash. Whole milk is preferred uh, from years one to two. However, that is really case dependent. Um, if you do have a one-year-old that's already above the 95th percentile, um, you may not want them to be in whole milk. Uh, so you really need to look at the guidelines for the cardiovascular health and risk and see if that infant or that child needs to be on either one or 2% milk.
just because there's always that potential risk for obesity. So beverages. Um, plain, unflavored water is preferred. Soft drinks and other sweetened beverages, such as fruit drinks and flavored water, should be strongly discouraged. And that's because it's a major source of added sugar. It can cause obesity. And also, it's associated with lower intake of other key elements or nutrients. Miscellaneous foods, desserts, sweets, candy, jams, and jelly. Um, as you can see, from 12 to 23 months, it really should be limited. And I think that the reason for that is if you don't expose these kids to those kind of foods earlier, when they get older, they're not going to have that craving for those foods either. So. So uh, this is another study I found um, that really had some important facts that a general pediatrician should know about. In 2008, a cross-sectional survey of daily intakes for toddlers and preschools in the US showed that about one-fourth of toddlers consumed no servings of fruit on any given day. One-third of toddlers uh, consumed no servings of veggies on any given day. After 12 months of age, French fries and other fried potatoes were the most common vegetable consumed. And between 60 to 80% of toddlers and approximately 85% of preschoolers consume some, some type of sweetened beverage, dessert, sweet, or salty snack every day. So uh, obviously, these all show precursors to obesity. So I think as a general pediatrician, it's very important um, to counsel families on correct eating habits. And you want to start this early. So common vitamin deficiencies we see uh, in our children are, include vitamin A, vitamin C, and vitamin E deficiency. Vitamin A uh, deficiency is going to present with poor night vision, dry skin, hair, and nails. Uh, children will exhibit poor growth, apathy, and developmental delay. Rich foods for vitamin A um, include liver, beef, chicken, dairy products, and yellow vegetables. Vitamin C deficiency will present with scurvy, muscle weakness, ecchymosis, petechiae, hyperkeratosis of the hair. Rich vitamin C foods include bell peppers, leafy greens, berries, citrus fruits. And vitamin E deficiency present with hemolytic anemia, edema, thrombocytosis. And you see this a lot more in our premature infants because the transfer of vitamin E does not occur until the third trimester. And vitamin E rich foods are almonds, spinach, turnip greens, and kale. So I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the vegetarian diet, because this is becoming more common, I think, more in our adolescent period. They want to become more dependent and make their own decisions. And so it's good to know that there's all different kinds of types of vegetarian diets. Some include eggs, milk, and milk products. Some include no eggs, but milk products, and some include uh, absolutely no eggs or milk, and they're strict vegans. So um, I think it's also important to, if you knew an adolescent that was on a full balanced diet and then they come to you the next week telling you they want to become a vegetarian, you may need to screen for eating disorders at this point. Um, so it's good to calculate their BMI and plot that on the curve. And if it's below the 15th percentile, um, that should be a red flag for you. But do you know it is possible to get a complete balanced nutrition from a vegetarian diet, but it does require some particular counseling and care. And these are the five things that you want to always keep in mind when you're dealing with a patient with a vegetarian diet. So energy, are they getting enough energy in their diet? And they could be consuming low caloric density foods, and so they're not going to be getting enough energy. So you want to tell, tell the child that they should be taking in three meals a day with three snacks per day to include nutrient dense foods. Uh, protein, they need to be eating a variety of complementary plant foods to, to meet their caloric needs. So things like beans, lentils, peanuts, and peanut butter is a really good source for vegetarians <coughs> because it's high in calories and it also provides all those amino acids. Iron, they're definitely at risk for iron deficiency because they're not consuming that heme iron meats. So a source of ascorbic acid should be provided at each meal to enhance the absorption of non-heme iron. And so high vitamin C's, as I mentioned in the previous slide, include leafy greens, broccoli, berries, citrus fruits. Also, tofu is a good source of iron and zinc. Calcium, if they're not drinking milk, they can become calcium deficient. 
Um, and so they need one calcium rich food at each meal and they can get that through greens like broccoli, collards, and kale. And vitamin B12 is the most common deficiency you'll see with vegetarians because they're not consuming meat or dairy products. And so they need to be taking in soy milk and cereals to get that vitamin B12. Okay, so now we'll be um, moving on to obesity. This has become a major eating disorder in the US today. As prevalence of obesity increases, so does prevalence of comorbidities. And children older than two should have their BMI calculated, plotted on, a, on the appropriate curve. And the BMI is the body weight divided by the height squared. Um, and the BMI is gonna tell you if they're underweight, normal weight, overweight, or obese. And so it's really imperative that healthcare providers, um, as general pediatricians, really identify overweight and obese children so that counseling and treatment can be provided. So this is a chart that showed the prevalence of obesity among children and teenagers by age group um, in a, between 1963 and 2010. And as you can see, uh, obesity has just been steadily increasing in the US and it's really taken over over the past uh, 40 to 50 years. So what are complications, uh, complications that uh, obesity can lead to? It can lead to diabetes, metabolic syndrome, PCOS, hypertension, dyslipidemia, fatty liver disease, cholestasis, OSA. And so I think these complications should really be discussed with the child and the family, because sometimes it can just be eye, opener, eye openers for the child. Um, when I see an overweight or obese adolescent, I really tell them like, you're way too young to be on high blood pressure medications and you should be worrying about these things way later in life. And sometimes that can really just uh, open their eyes to, their ish to this issue. So how should pediatricians approach these patients? The first step is to obtain a very good his diet history. And you wanna identify the caretakers who feed the child, identify foods that are high in calories to that you can eliminate, and assess the eating patterns. So the first thing after I get a good diet history, the first thing that usually can be eliminated is juice and soda. And I tell the mom that if you just stop buying these things for the child, the, the child will no longer have access to these things. And so, and another thing that I've also noticed when I take a diet history is a lot of these children say, I don't eat breakfast and then I go to school. I don't eat lunch because the school food is gross. And then I come back home around three or four and I have my first meal of the day then. So it's, studies have shown that children who do eat less frequent meals and those who skip meals are more likely to be obese than those who eat frequently. Because what happens is when the child gets home from school around three or four, they have a big meal and then they're just snacking the rest of the evening or night away. And so we need to tell them that they need to have more structure to their meal plans. Next, you wanna get a good activity history. Um, you wanna identify if there's any barriers as to why they can't walk or ride a bike to school evaluate time of spent in play, evaluate school recess and PE, assess after school and weekend activities, and assess um, screen time. So a lot of these kids recently I've noticed um, say they don't get PE at school, which was pretty shocking to me because when I was in elementary school and middle school, we had PE every day. So if they're not getting these activities at school, it's vital that they get these activities at home. So I tell them as soon as you get home around three or four, put your stuff away and just go outside. Whether it's just a walk around the neighborhood for 20, 30 minutes, it's you know, a jog, or it's just kicking a ball around. It needs to be something active before they start their homework or anything like that. And you also wanna stress to the family that all these changes aren't gonna be done in one visit. Um, so it's gonna take several months, and maybe it can even take up to a year to really start seeing changes. And so you need to explain that to the family so that they understand. So uh, when we're trying to make changes, the first thing you want to deal with is the nutrition factor. In phase one, you want to choose sugar-free beverages, water or low-fat milk, you want to cut fast food, and you want to choose three meals with one snack per day. In phase two, you want to tell them they can eat a variety of foods and eat proper portion sizes. So you want to really set realistic goals for these children. Um, to try and lose 20 pounds in a month, that's not realistic. And so it's good to kind of bring up the growth chart in the room and show them where they are on the curve and how much they do need to lose to get back on the curve, but that this can take several months. 
Um, and so even if I see a child today and I'm going to follow him up in three months for a weight check, if he's at least the same weight, hasn't gained anymore, that's a good thing. So here are some spotlight foods um, that we can tell the parents about. The green is go. They can eat a lot of whole grains, lean meats, beans, fruits, veggies. The yellow are foods that they can eat some of, but we don't want them to eat too much of. And red foods are definitely foods we want them to stay away from. Stuff like cinnamon rolls, croissants, fried chicken, anything fried really, uh, butter and sour cream. Um, and so we need to tell the, the, the parents to stop buying these things. And a lot of the times, these obese kids walk in with obese parents, too. And so it really needs to be a family decision. Uh, we're trying to make the family a healthier family. So uh, they, the parents really just need to stop buying these foods for the child and also for them. Uh, I think we should start also giving out uh, sample menus at our visits. Um, this can help the, and encourage the child to kind of be more involved in this decision making and kind of get excited about wanting to lose weight. Um, the child should go shopping with the, mom, with the parents and cook with the parents at home, and this will just motivate, motivate the child more. The next step is to deal with the exercise part. Um, you need to first decrease uh, the time spent in sedentary activities. And phase two incorporates physical activity into daily routines, uh, such as not taking the elevator and taking the stairs instead. Accumulate one hour of physical activity during the day and be physically active as a family. So go for a walk together you know, in the evening. And then participate in organized sports. I think this is a great idea to get parents involved um, Get, put their child in basketball in summer camps or uh, bas uh, football or soccer, just because if they're doing these things with other kids around with them, then they're more likely to want to be part of that team. Here are some tips uh, for parents that we can talk about. I think number one is portion control. Um, a lot of these kids will tell you, well, I don't get seconds, thirds, or fourths, but that's because their first portion is pretty big. And so uh, we need to really tell them to, they need to really break down that first portion. Um, and the parents really just need to set good role models because if they're eating junk food and the, ch the child has to eat a salad, they're going to be like, why, why don't I get to eat that too? So they need to set rules and they need to set a me mealtime schedule, I think is the, is the most important two things to do. Um, obviously, we're going to be dealing with a lot of challenges when we are going to be trying to help these patients. And so I thought this was a pretty cool. Uh, if there's a challenge, there's a solution. Um, one of them is like family frequently eats meals away from home. So first, identify why, if there are any uh, barriers to prevent the family from eating at home more often or provide uh, meal planning resources and address the type of restaurants and use the selections to discuss alternatives. So what's going on in our shreveport Bossier area? I wanted to talk about Alliance of Healthier Generation. And this is a group of uh, some middle schools and elementary schools that have gotten together to really give a healthier um, outlook on life for these kids. So every meal at these schools has one fruit or one veg vegetable that is provided. They have PE at least twice a week. They have recess every day for 20 minutes and the snacks that they provide are less than 100 calories. So this way, the kids have more structure at school, and I also think that this needs to be carried on at home. Uh, Children's Healthy Weight and Activity Clinic is our clinic that we have here that's run by uh, Mandy Duncan and Dr. Gungor, Dr. McVee. It's a great resource uh, that we have that you can uh, refer to them in EPIC. Um, I think the first time you see this child, you probably could take 20, 30 minutes to kind of, you know, get a good diet history, activity history, and really um, do a lot of uh, counseling with them. And then Mandy can see them more often because she uh, obviously can sit down with them and give them more resources to use, and she does a really good job with, with uh, these kids. And I also wanted to mention the AAP Institute for Healthy Childhood Weight. This is a great website that I could email out to everybody. Um, there's a lot of little things on the website, uh, resources for pediatricians, and um, 
one thing I wanted to talk about was something called Change Talk, and it's an interactive cha uh, training simulation to help pediatricians learn motivational and interviewing skills to counsel the family. So I have a little video to summarize everything we've talked about. It's gonna work. Came in, heart attack. Five nine, three hundred pounds, thirty two years old. How the hell does that happen? <gasps> Can I get a? Uh... Could be developing diabetes. You have to make a change. Oh yeah. You're graduating. <laughs> You can't do this. Yes, can I get a... Yeah, no, uh, deep dish. You have to make a change. Good job, Jim. You got an A+. Plus. Give this child some shots. I know, but it's the only thing that'll make you stop. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we need to start playing that for our patients. But I thought that was a good summary. Just tells you where these kids are going. Um, so, let's see if this works. These are my resources. Thank you. You guys have any questions, comments? Yeah, you said for the, for the infants, vitamin D requirements 400 international units uh, who are strictly breastfed. Is there, a, is there a requirement, a vitamin D requirement for mothers? Like, should they have an increased vitamin D intake? Yeah, they should. I did read that, but I don't have the exact numbers, but they do. There, there's a new study that just came out that if you want to provide mom with vitamin D and not the baby, mom has to take like 2,400 international units a day. And then if they're African American, it's up to 6,000. So it's really much better to just provide the baby with it. Also, if they're formula fed, they have to be getting at least 32 ounces of formula a day in order to get the 400 international units that they need. So if they're not getting 32 ounces a day, they really need to be getting supplemented too. So that's something that a lot of us don't really think about, but um, all of those nutrition facts are based on 32 ounces of formula. You did an awesome job. We don't think about this stuff enough. And it would be really good for us to have a handout, like that sample menu to provide to our patients because some of them really have no idea what is healthy. They don't eat the same diet that yeah, we well, do. I don't think French fries are yeah. healthy. Yeah. So that's a really good point. I was going to say, another barrier though, a lot of parents don't want to admit this. Like I've tried to send a lot of patients to Mandy's clinic and the Mandy calls and the mom goes, I don't want my child to think that she's obese. I don't want my child to think she's overweight. So I will not take it. So there's a lot of parenting that needs to be involved in this because there's so many that their kids to feel bad that they're yeah. overweight. And so uh, I try not to, I know we all call it the obesity clinic, but I try not to tell that to the family. I tell them Mandy's a nurse that really uh, has a lot more time to and has more resources to counsel you on trying to get to that healthier lifestyle. So maybe try saying it in a different way. Maybe they won't think that it's just for their obese child, so. And there, in Epic, there's a healthy snack. Like, if you look up healthy foods, there's on the discharge instructions, there's smart phrases for that. So you can just add that into their discharge instructions when they're leaving. So I think that the, the very good point is that 
<clears throat> it's easier to educate families and try and prevent this from happening rather than dealing with a patient when the patient's already overweight or obese. So, so I think that's really is, is important. I think you gave a lot of good information uh, in, in this talk. And I think the important thing is that you need to spend the time with the families as part of anticipatory guidance is to look carefully at diet and to try and educate families as to what's the appropriate way to go forward so that you can prevent some of this from happening. And so, so your, your reverse of life there, <laughs> video at the end kind of highlighted the points. Yeah. Uh, this is a great place where the motivational engine comes to play because there's a lot of times with parents if you change it to, to address what Max is saying to where you don't come off as if you're saying y'all weren't doing this, you're not doing this, you're not that. And I know sometimes people don't realize that you may come off that way, but if you approach them to where you say, hey, how can we try to change this situation for everyone, then people become more involved and want to become more involved in trying to actually do it. And it's been a lot of studies showing that to change diet, that motivational interviewing really can help. So that, this is a good place to try to do that because you want them to feel actively involved in changing their own lifestyle. And another point too is most families are overweight. It's not just the child. And trying to get parents to understand that this is not just a change for their child, but for them, and that they need to lead a healthy life is also really important. They all have family members who have diabetes and die at young ages, so it's a big family involvement, I think. Sometimes you just have to make one change at a time. Mm -hmm. You ask them, for the, for the students, you ask them, you know, what is one thing that you can change before next month or less you can? So saying, go out and shop and buy all this stuff and change this whole life. What resources are available to our patients who live in the so-called food deserts where they may not have access to all these foods that they're supposed to be eating their sugar? That's a good question. Um, hmm. That seems yeah. to me like the crux of the issue. A lot of our patients in the area sort of don't have you know, a nice grocery store. Right. I mean, even but at Walmart, and they're, they're so if they're, they're on wet, wet. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if they're getting the wet, then they're getting the vouchers for different fruits and vegetables and stuff. So you can go just to Walmart and get that on their wick. Um, but that's until they're five, it's you know. And then, does anybody know what juice is on wick now? It's 100% juice. <laughs> I still think it's too much yeah. juice, in my opinion. I mean, I think. They should add more you know, fresh fruits and vegetables, but I'm not sure if that's an ounce. But I know the vouchers cover a large amount. I mean, it's a pretty good quantity. I, was just, I remember when Juicy Juice was on quick, and it's like 5%. It's so they changed it like about five years ago. I think it's like 100% juice. I'm sure it's still. So you'll see people. Okay, other questions? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>